Thanks, everybody. I'm sure at least one of those people on Rate My Professor was my mom, so you know, <laughs> take it with a grain of salt. Thank you all for being here today. I'm really excited to be a part of this. Uh, this has been a very amazing conference, and I'm just kind of humbled to share the stage with uh, all, these, uh, all, these, all these great speakers. I'm going to speak today a little bit about what I do. Um, when, I, when I finished college, I, I had a degree in electrical engineering, and it was great. I, I loved learning electrical engineering, but I, I was really unsure what I wanted to do with myself, and I, I didn't really want to spend a career doing something kind of mundane. I really wanted to feel like I was doing something over the horizon. So I decided to pursue a dream that I'd had since high school and uh, become a biomedical engineer. So I went to graduate school to study that. Biomedical engineers are people who design things like pacemakers or artificial hips, artificial knees, um, MRIs, that, that sort of thing. So I went to graduate school and I got involved in this project uh, to do brain machine interfaces, trying to reanimate the body. Now before I go on, uh, I'm going to tell you some pretty fantastic stuff. And it's fantastic because other people did it. Um, it's a huge field involving researchers from hundreds of universities in just about every country I can spell. And you know, I work on a teeny weeny small part of it. So please uh, don't, you know, this is not all what I have done. I'm kind of trying to summarize where, where the whole field is. Uh, but a small part of this is going on up the street from you in uh, Philadelphia. So the goal is reanimating the body. And we typically are interested in helping people who have had an amputation or maybe they've suffered some sort of spinal cord injury. And we'd like to be able to help them to reanimate their body. So it, you'd be able to use their brain to control a prosthesis or to be able to control their own limb again just under the power of thought. Uh, there's been a real groundswell in this area in recent years. There have been uh, some unbelievable advances in prosthetics that have been made. Um, so all we need now is the brain control. This is uh, kind of a real burgeoning field. So I'd like to tell you a little bit about how you build one of these things, right? So wh when it comes to down to brass tacks, how do you actually put one of these together? Well, you start with a brain. And uh, the first thing you have to do is ask the brain what, what it's thinking. So you have to have some way of, of acquiring information. So you put a bunch of electrodes down, and information comes out. And holy cow, it's a great big jumbled mess. OK, we don't know what it means. We don't know uh, how it's organized. I mean, data comes out, but data doesn't mean anything unless you know how to interpret it. OK? And it's actually worse than, than even the, uh, the slide here would suggest, because there's no guarantee that the tiles would even be in English, right? I mean, they could be in, in Greek characters. They could be in Arabic characters. Like, you know, it's, it's really just a jumble what comes out of the brain. And we sort of have to work backwards to figure out how to interpret those signals. So the cha Oop. There we go. So the challenge is to figure out how to take those Scrabble tiles and sort them out into something that, that can be used as a control command to say, oh, the brain is thinking about moving the arm to the left. OK, so then you can control a prosthetic to move an arm to the left. All right, so it turns out that it's even harder than that, because nothing in the brain remains static, right? So if you think about moving your arm left three different times, you might get more or less the same behavior, but every time it's a little bit different, OK? You get sort of the same shape, but it's just a little bit different from trial to trial. So when you're designing a device to figure out what the brain is thinking, you have to build these statistical maps that can take into account the fact that, yeah, this pretty much looks like the left command. It's a little bit different than before, but I'm pretty sure that's what, what it is. And there's a lot of reasons for that, right? I don't know if you can see that, but you know, you might be thinking about, did I leave the stove on, or my taxes are due next month, or I think I hear an ice cream truck down the street. OK. <laughs> so like, I don't know about you, when I hear the ice cream truck, like, all, all thoughts go out the window. So your brain signals wind up being modified uh, sort of without you even being uh, in control of it. And it's actually, even, it's actually even worse than that. Nope, come on. There we go. It's actually even worse than that because on a larger time scale, uh, your brain is plastic and it evolves over time. And brain waves that work one day may be completely different uh, a week down the road or a month down the road. Our brains are constantly changing. So when we design systems to try to interpret what the brain is thinking, we have to be able to take this into account, that what works today may not work tomorrow. So we have to have systems that, that can uh, retune themselves on the fly. There's some unbelievable engineering challenges involved. So there's a lot of places you can get the signals from. Um, so, and, and each one serves a different purpose. So there are some people who work in brain machine interfaces where they try to get the electrodes right from the scalp surface. So this is great because it's non-invasive. You don't have to put a single pinprick in your patient. Um, the disadvantage is those electrodes wind up being kind of far away from the brain, and they're recording average behavior of millions of neurons. But you know, you don't have to have any holes drilled in your head, which, which is a plus. Um, 
on the, on the other end of the scale, if you can see in the top middle, you can actually put electrodes in the brain. Those are tungsten microwires, each one smaller than a human hair. And if you cram enough of them through a tiny little hole in the, in the skull, you can wind up recording from hundreds or even thousands of neurons. And then you're actually listening to the, to the most fine grain uh, thing you can listen to, actual neurons firing. And you can try to decode their pattern. You can also listen to peripheral nerves. And there's a lot of options that are involved. Um, in terms of applications, brain-machine interfaces also try to solve a lot of different problems. So you can try to do something like a speller, which is, um, or control a computer, for example, which is kind of a very high level, uh, low degree of freedom problem. You could try to control a multi-degree of freedom robotic limb, which now you need to extract much more sophisticated uh, signals from the brain. Uh, but there's also another purpose, and that's actually where I really get most passionate about, about the kind of work that I do. Uh, that brain is there to remind us that at the end of the day, none of this work is possible unless we really try to understand how the brain is working. And so what engineers like myself are able to bring to, to the table, uh, which, is, which is a little bit new in the, in the historical study of neuroscience, is that we're able to leverage engineering tools to the study of the brain. So we're trying to bring a new tool to the table to help decode how the brain works and what it's telling us. So at the end of the day, what this is really all about is unraveling the language of the mind, all right? And trying to be able to figure out how we can tap into that power. So here's a little cartoon to kind of show you what happens. Here's a couple of uh, neurons minding their own business in the brain. And where's the electrode? Show me, there it is. OK, so there's the electrode pops down. There's the computer. Uh, so you put about half a million dollars of electronics between the two of those. And then neuron one fires. And look, you got an action potential. And oh, let's see if that happened too fast. OK, so the green neuron fired. You got a green spike. The red neuron fires. You get a red spike. OK, so the spikes look different. And now you, you, have, um, you get a recording. Um, all right, so they're a little bit dim, but I'll, I'll walk you through it. So this is what a typical brain recording looks like. You get a bunch of hash uh, interspersed with spikes. Those spikes occur every time a, a neuron fires. And on the bottom trace is basically that same thing, but a little bit zoomed in. And I don't know if you can see it, but we've got uh, three instances of one neuron firing and one instance of some other neuron firing. And essentially what we do is we just count how often those neurons fire. And we try to correlate firing rates to different behaviors. So we say, oh, look, it looks like every time so-and-so thinks about moving his arm to the left, neuron one fires a little bit faster, neuron two fires a little bit slower. You can work backwards and put that information together and come up with some sort of statistical guess about what the brain is thinking. So it's uh, a little bit limited, but it works, right? It's, it's what we've got. So right off the bat now, we have, a, we have an engineered model about how the brain works. Um, and that model is that that firing rate of these neurons uh, is correlated with some control command that you're trying to issue. So that's a testable hypothesis about how the brain uh, manages information. So this is uh, what, a, what a typical recording might look like. Uh, this is synthetic data that I just cooked up on my computer, so don't get too excited. Um, but it gives you an idea about what's going on. If you look at neuron five, neuron five fires a whole bunch, right? It starts firing when the arm is at position one, but it continues to fire. Uh, you know, so as you imagine somebody's moving their arm, like in an arc, for example, that neuron continues to fire until the arm is at position zero. So if you just listen to neuron five, you wouldn't really have any clue where the arm is because it's, it's it response to such a broad range of arm locations. So the solution to that is that you don't just look at one neuron, you look at five neurons, or 100, or 1,000, or 10,000, all right? And then you look at an average across them. And then you can say, oh, look, well, neuron five is firing, but neuron four is firing, and neuron three just a little bit, OK? And then you can work backwards from these massively freaky multidimensional statistical models and say, I've got a pretty good idea that the arm is at, wants to be at position you know, 0.5. And then you can command a robotic arm to move to 0.5. And amazingly, this works. Um, the literature is full of examples of people who've used technology like this to control robotic arms, robotic legs, computer cursors. Uh, it's, it's a very versatile technology. So uh, this slide is meant to illustrate one of the things that I love most about uh, working with brain-machine interfaces. And it's one of the things that, that we've, we've uh, become most cognizant of in my lab that we're spending a lot of time thinking about. And it works like this. Uh, w when you design a system like this and you have somebody start to think about moving a robotic limb, in the beginning it doesn't work really well. But after time, the user becomes a lot more able to use it. And the reason is, is because of brain plasticity. Over time, the user is really motivated to be able to control that arm or to be able to control that cursor. And subconsciously, the neurons that are, that are driving the prosthesis will retune themselves on the fly to control the prosthetic. 
which is really unbelievable, right? It's like saying, you don't have to build the best brain machine interface possible, right? You just have to build a lousy enough brain machine interface that the brain can adapt to it, okay? I know of no other form of engineering where this is true. Can you imagine saying, I don't need to build a whole bridge, okay, <laughs> right? <laughs> I need to build a half a bridge, and then Philadelphia will just slide on over, okay? Because it was, because <laughs> it looks so attractive. And then that's what we're dealing with, right? So this is awesome. Like, if you're designing hardware to build brain-machine interfaces, this is a godsend, right? So we're now trying to leverage the power of the brain to make these brain-machine interfaces. So uh, in order to figure out how to design the most efficient brain-machine interface, this is something that, that we're cooking up in my lab, just to give you like a flavor of something that we actually do. Um, we try to build mathematical models that will teach us how to decode what the brain does. So for example, we have a mathematical model of adaptation in uh, the cerebellum, and, and we use that to drive uh, a brain-machine interface, and then our brain-machine interface drives a robotic arm. And then you can say, so you have this little adaptive feedback loop, and then you can say, all right, now I'm going to go to my brain-machine interface and yank out half the memory, okay, or I'm going to have the processor speed, or I'm going to uh, do whatever. And then I'm going to see if the brain can catch up, because we know the brain is adaptive, so you say, look, can the brain keep up? Can the brain still control the arm to an acceptable tolerance? And if the answer is yes, then great. Okay, you've, you've gotten rid of half your system, which means that if you're trying to help a patient, you've either doubled your battery life, or you've halved the size of the, of, the, of the electronics that you might have to implant in their body. So you've really gained some advantages there. Instead of testing this with, with animals or with people, it just turned out to be too complicated, and there's way too many dimensions to test across. We're, uh, we're designing a synthetic system where we can model this and just test this in the laboratory. So uh, this is something that we have under, uh, under development right now. Got a little grant money to work on that. And uh, it's keeping a few grad students uh, hard at work right now. Um, so OK, so where does this leave us? Um, again, I said the real value behind this, you know, eventually science will come up with other solutions for reanimating the body. Eventually, if you lose a prosthetic limb, some doctor somewhere is going to you know, paint some goop on, on it, and y your arm is just going to grow back. So, so where's the value in this really, right? The value in this is that, that we're learning how the brain works, OK? And we have new tools to, to kind of pick apart for the first time how the brain works and what's it's doing and, and why is it doing what it's doing. And it's really interesting because the brain is a processor, OK? But it's designed to solve very different problems than a regular computer. A regular computer is designed to do things like add numbers, OK? If you need to add five million numbers together in under a second, computer's your friend, right? Or if you need to sh search the entire works of Shakespeare, uh, in, in the flash of an eye, you need a computer to do that, okay? So computers are unbelievably efficient at certain tasks because they were designed to solve those problems. Great. The brain, on the other hand, uh, is good at a different set of tasks, okay? The brain, for example, is very good at finding Waldo, okay? <laughs> My four-year-old son can find Waldo. Um, you could certainly program a computer to find Waldo, but a computer was not made to find Waldo, okay? So you might have to write, have to write tens of thousands of lines of computer code, and certainly in terms of the power that gets expended to find Waldo, it's a very inefficient search, right? You think about all the watts that are driving the computer, you know, the memory, the fan, all that stuff that, that, that goes on. You know, your brain is a relatively low power device. So, you know, that's what it was built to do, and it's very good at doing what, it's good, what it was designed to do. Computer's very good at doing what it was designed to do. A uh, computer, uh, a brain is also very good at looking at two faces and saying, you know, those faces are very different, but that's the same person, okay? A brain can do that. Computer, again, you could program the computer to do it, but it wasn't made to do that, and it would do it very inefficiently compared to what the brain can do. Um, so, in case you're wondering, there's Waldo right there under, under the brain. Um, <laughs> I won't tell you how much time I lost when I was making this slide. Uh, finding Waldo, I should have just asked my son. All right. So um, I'm sure he would have done it for a small promotional fee. Um, so anyway, so what we're learning by, by studying the brain is how to, tap into, uh, how to tap into the processing that the brain has, how to tap into um, what it can do. So now you're in a situation where uh, when you start to understand what the brain is capable of, and you start to understand its language, and you start to understand what it was built for, you can start to imagine a situation where we could leverage its power. Okay? If we're learning its language, we could learn to harness that to make a lot of our day-to-day -day problems a lot easier. In fact, I can imagine a situation where uh, maybe 50 or 100 years down the line, when you buy a computing device, sure, it might have a central processing unit, 
and uh, maybe a graphics card. And it might also have a bundle of neurons in there somewhere, okay? Maybe call it your contextual processing unit. And the contextual processing unit would handle tasks that the central processing unit, right, the silicon, stuff that the silicon's not really built to design, uh, built to do. So the silicon would add the numbers, and the conceptual processing unit would say, this is why these numbers are important. Or, I'm pretty sure that this is a relevant piece of information that just came across the line. So we might be able to use uh, our understanding of how brains work to do computing in a radically different way than has ever been done before, okay? Brains are good at doing certain things. Let's harness them uh, for, for that activity. So the flip side of the coin is, if you can train a computer to become a little more human, is it also true that maybe you could use that same technology backwards and make a human a little bit more computational? I think the answer is yes. Okay, I can envision a future uh, far down the line where uh, we have memory chips, okay? So if you wanna have a un unspeakable photographic memory, uh, that might be possible. Um, or if you'd like to be able to have your MP3s play directly into your auditory cortex, that, <laughs> that might happen, right? So, okay, fine, I'm, I'm being a little bit creative and taking some creative license here in, in, in imagining the future, but um, that could happen, okay? Uh, the kind of technologies we're learning, how to interface uh, information with the brain is, is one of the things that I think is, is kind of on the horizon moving forward. So I don't think it's anything to be afraid of. I, I, I think uh, these advances are natural and, and we're gonna learn a lot uh, and maybe even become a little bit, uh, little bit more human in the process. So one last picture, that's my daughter. Um, yeah, she's pretty cute. Um, she's a year old now and she still does that a lot. Um, so, you know, it, ultimately, is this, gonna, is this gonna change our humanity to have this kind of technology interact with us? And I, ultimately, I don't think so. I think we're, we're always gonna be human. We're always, what makes us human is always gonna, gonna stay the same. Um, I, I think these new technologies moving forward are just gonna evolve us a little bit and make us a little bit more uh, capable of uh, dealing with our uh, community, interacting with each other. They'll maybe help us be more creative, uh, more productive, more interesting. So, um, you know, it's cool stuff coming down the line, uh, but ultimately, uh, our humanity will remain with us. Thank you. Thank you.